go to the Lord in prayer. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for today. What a beautiful day and weather we have out, outdoors today. And and uh, just thank you for the, the message from John Mark this morning and the, the taste of cottonwood that's going on downstairs right now. Lord, I pray that uh, there will be families that are connected to a, to a class that uh, can really get involved in the, in the community and with our church. And just look forward to, to the relationships uh, that are taking place there. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, anyway, yeah, and as far as... Uh, Taste of cottonwood. Anybody go down there and get a get a taste on their yeah. on the way up or anything? No. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. That's always. Yes, I did. Good. <laughs> yeah. At least you're a lot lot closer. To the 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 kids were the ones that really filled up down there. Yeah. They were they were really liking that. So. <laughs> so that's a that's a good thing. All right. We're ready to do a little singing now. Yeah. All right. Let's go. So I've discovered we have somebody here that might also be able to fill in for Ken when he's not here. Yeah. And I am really excited. He shall remain nameless until he fills in one day. <laughs> um, Psalm 33, verse 20 says, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our shepherd. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And I did. Are you the teacher, Dad? Like that. Well, I did look over your notes, and so I felt like that scripture was pretty uh, relevant. And so uh, we'd like to start by singing hymn number 61. No, I'm sorry, hymn number 52. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think I've mentioned before when I was up here, if we all lift up our hymnals like this, our, our faces are raised and our voices are raised, and we can all lift it, make a joyful noise up here instead of down into our book. So, um, maybe you are.
quickly. Uh, man, hasn't it been awesome this last six, seven weeks that we've been studying the, the scriptures? And uh, today we get uh, a guest teacher for us today, Joe. Thank you for coming in and, and stepping in in the absence of our, of our teachers and teaching the lessons for us today. Thank you, Joe. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Even though I know you had no choice in the matter. <laughs> I still I still cringe a little bit when someone says I'll be teaching. I really don't think of myself as a teacher. I'm uh, very much a lay teacher, you might say. Um, this is my fifth time doing this. So um, let me hit a few logistics first, and then maybe I'll give a little bit more background on you. Um, so we will be in Exodus 16. I can't really read that on the board, but Exodus 16. Uh, I do have some readings. I hear there are people who really enjoy reading in the group. So whoever does, they can come up when there's reading time. So we'll do that. Uh, but maybe just a little background on me. So probably one of the most important parts about me, this is my wife, Janelle, over here. So uh, Janelle's here. Uh, but like I said, we, you know, I always like to give a little bit of background on us. Um, so we, Janelle and I both grew up Catholic. Um, we didn't really resonate so much with everything when I, mean, I went to Catholic school growing up, but uh, never really clicked. And I think part of that's probably because I think in our families, we were always sort of the A types, the achievers, the overachievers even, and probably just never felt like we had a need uh, right for God or to have him in our lives. And I think that probably lasted until, so we had our, we, we were married in 2007. So 777 is our anniversary. So. <laughs> easy to remember. Um, had our first daughter in 2008, and then probably in 2011, we really just started to hit the rocks in our marriage. And we ended up spending two years separated. Um, a friend of mine invited me down to the village church in Flower Mound, and uh, it was the first time that I really started to open my eyes. And I got to a point where I really just asked the Lord to come into my life and just help me, right? And Whatever that meant, whether that meant reconciliation in my marriage or what, whatever it meant, I was good with it. I just wanted him to come into my life, and he did. And over that same time, miraculously, he came into Janelle's life too. And after two years, we reconciled back together. Uh, we had our son in 2014, right? 2014, we had our son, so we named him Cooper Cross Kennedy. And, uh, and then we found our church home here in about 2017, and we got baptized together here. And uh, probably around 2019, I went through the ministry academy here, uh, and now here I am. So, you know, we've, other than that, we've been in the corporate world for 20 years, um, but I really just feel like, so in the ministry academy, one of the things they had us do is take a spiritual gifts test. And one of the things that apparently I'm gifted in is teaching, and so here I am. Although I'm probably the most introverted person you'll ever meet, so the fact that I'm up here standing in front of you is the Lord alone and nothing else. So, but here I am. So, anyway, appreciate you for indulging me on that story. But that's so it's my fifth time up here. So, anyway, keep your keep the bar low. <laughs> so, so Exodus 16. So I understand you guys have been going through the book of Exodus. Um, so I, I before we do the first reading, um, I thought it would help if. Maybe I just did a 30,000 foot view of kind of where we've, where we've been in the book, right? Um, and, and the other thing I'll mention, so I'm also titling today's sort of teaching, God's provision and our doubt and disobedience, right? And I think it's something that's really easy to look back at these folks back in the Old Testament and say, well, they were very disobedient and shame on them, but I don't think it's a far leap to look at ourselves today and, and see a lot of the same characteristics, right? So. Um, so, so a quick overview of kind of where we've been. Hopefully this sounds familiar. So obviously we start the book of Exodus with God's people, you know, under oppression there in Egypt. Um, we see the birth of Moses, right? So he's born to an Israelite mother, right? She pushes down the stream, right? He's raised in the, in the Egyptian culture, if you will. Um, and then we see in chapter three, we see the sort of the, the famous burning bush scene, right? We see the Lord calling Moses, right? To go, go tell my people, right? And and immediately we see Moses with the excuses, right? Don't don't send me. I can't do it. I can't talk. I can't I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. Um, and he says, go, right? And then and then Moses says, well, who who am I supposed to say sent you, right? 
or sent me down here. And he says, what does he say? Tell them I am, right? I love that line. Tell them I am sent you, right? <clears throat> and so we see that. We see Moses go down. We see him confront Pharaoh. We see this sort of great cosmic battle, right, between our God and the God of the Egyptians, right, and Pharaoh. Um, and so we see that confrontation. Of course, our God wins that battle, of course. Um, we see the plagues. Uh, we see the Passover event, right? And then we see the Lord leading his people, right, out of captivity. Um, so probably over the last few weeks, you've gone through that, right, and leading them out. You know, the, the cloud, right, as he's leading them to where they're going, you, you see the Red Sea event, right, the parting of the Red Sea. Um, and then we get to chapter 15, right, which is where we see the song, right, that they sing to the Lord, um, which, which I also love, right? You, you, you see this song, um, and you, you really get a good sense of sort of who they are seeing as their God at that point, right? Like they've gone through this Red Sea event, they're, it's just miraculous, they're rejoicing, uh, and then it isn't long after that, right, that now we're thirsty, Right? And now we start the grumbling, right? And so this is where we start to see where we lead into chapter 16, where we are. Uh, and then so with that, we're going to kind of go into the first reading. So I don't know if we have a first brave soul. Okay. So you already know what you're reading? Yeah. You guys are pros at this. Do that. Okay. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Israel, the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough food for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and this is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will, go, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord for he has heard your grumbling. And while Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in a cloud. All right, so told you they were going to grumble. So yeah, I think it's easy, right, for us to look at that and say, wow, they just saw this event, and yet here they are grumbling, right? But at the same time when I say that, I guess they were without water for three days, right? And they were, right? They did have to go through some things that I think I probably speak for a lot of us. Or maybe when we're thirsty, when we're hungry, we're probably going to be a little bit grumbly, right? So... Um, but we definitely see them them grumbling again, right, about about the lack of food and and um, and even I think it's interesting, right, that they even yearned to be back in Egypt, right, where they had the pots of meat, right, and they had the food, and it's like, wow, like that's I get it, right, like that's a, an immediate need that they have, but right, all the things that they're not thinking about of what it was like to be back in Egypt, right, but yet they they want to go back there. Um, and, and there's even a, a passage, I know some of you may have, have printed out the materials that Russell sent out, but there's a, a quote as well in the book of Lamentations. Um, so chapter 4, verse 9 in La Lamentations, it, it reads, Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. Racked with hunger, they waste away from the lack of food from the field. So again, it's kind of referencing this. Maybe sometimes we do feel like when we're so hungry that it'd be better to just die than to you know, continue to go through the hunger, but that's definitely what the, the people were experiencing at that time. Um, but I think it's important as well for us to realize, you know, what it is that the Lord's doing, right? Like the Lord, as we know, is is deliberate, right? He's purposeful. Like these things aren't happening 
by accident. And I think there's three primary things I think he's doing as he's sending these people out into the wilderness. The first one, I think, is he's humbling his people. You know, I mentioned my own personal testimony. Like, I know for me, it's like, unless you get humbled by something, it's hard, right, to look up, right, unless you sort of get to that humble place. I think he's also testing them, right, to really know what's in their hearts, right? What do they value? What is their highest idol, if you will? So I think there's a matter of testing that he's putting them through as well. And the third thing is, I think he's seeing whether his people will keep his commandments or not, right? Will they be obedient to what he's asking them to do or not? I gave another passage reference there from Deuteronomy 8-2, which basically reads, remember how the Lord your God led you all away in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. So we see this later as well being spoken of, that this is why the Lord is leading you out there. It's not random. It's not arbitrary. But at the same time, right, he's also reiterating to them that he is the God, right? Again, it's, you know, one of the things we learned in the ministry academy is when you read the Old Testament, it's easy for us to look at people like the Abrahams and the Isaacs and the Sarahs and the Moseses, right, and to say, wow, like, look what they did. That's amazing what they did. But none of them are ever the hero, right, of the story, right? The hero is always God, right, in every case. And so I think here we also see, you know, Moses trying to reiterate to the people, like, he's the one that led you out. Look at all these things that he did for you, right? And so I think it's important for us as well to remember that. He's the God, and look at how faithful he's been to his people, and he's kept his promises, right? And so I think that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. And then again, right, we saw the pillar of cloud where the Lord was leading them to the Red Sea. And then again, we see as well here where the Lord appears to them in the cloud, right, to speak to them. And so, right, the Lord appears in the cloud. The Lord is now going to speak to them, which kind of leads us to our second reading. So, the second reader, Austin. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread of the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather up as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone they gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until the morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it till morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell, so Moses was angry with them. I know. It's like they continue, right? It's like when is this when is this gonna end? And I think we'll see in a little while the Lord's gonna ask that same question himself, right? So so again, I think we see here, right, the Lord, despite their grumblings, right, he's providing, right? He is still providing because he he's a good God, right? And he promised that he would do these things. And so he provides the bread, he provides the meat. Um one of the interesting things as I was reading up on, on some of the commentaries on this is, is the bread, right? So it, it sort of describes the bread, you know, the coriander seed, it was white, you know, what it tasted like. It's interesting that we don't have any known sort of natural substance that can really account for what that was, right? Like we don't have anything that naturally occurs that tastes anything like that, right? That was, I, I think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind there. Um, 
So, so again, right, we, we have here where, where the Lord is giving these specific commands to his people, right? He's testing their obedience, their faith, their trust. Um, you know, he's telling them how much to gather, right? Don't gather too much, right? And, and again, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious what he's doing, right? He's basically saying, I, I did this for you. I brought you out of Egypt. I will provide for you. Therefore, don't carry the food over till the next day. Why? Because I'm going to provide for you again on the next day, right? So he's clearly trying to tell them, this is what I want you to do to show that you trust me and that you will be obedient to me. Um, and, and so again, right, the, the people don't listen, right, to Moses. And, and really they're not listening to God, right? It's, it's Moses is the one who's kind of the mouthpiece, but really they're not listening to what, what God is telling them. And, and they keep the food over, and of course what happens? Well, it rots, right? It's, it's not going to work, guys, right? It's, you, you have to be obedient here. Um, but another thing that I thought was interesting here is when we get to verse 18, uh, and, and we see that even those who gathered what it describes as little, right? Like naturally, if someone gathers too little, you would think, well, wow, they're going to go hungry, right? But yet they don't, right? Yet even those who gathered little, uh, it was enough. And, and that's a quote I think I gave you guys as well from 2 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul is writing. And he says, as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Uh, and we think perhaps he's talking there just because of the context of what he's talking about, about being generous givers. And so there's sort of this notion that perhaps they shared with one another, the ones who had too much shared with those who had too little. And that's certainly a possibility. Um, but, but I think as well, it's also just the God provides, right? The ones who gathered too little were obedient, right? They were obedient and the Lord provided for them, right? Um, so I think that's definitely something that kind of popped out of me that I think is, is important for us to, to kind of think about. Um, so, so, so we see Moses, right, getting angry, right? And, and probably most of us would be angry with them at this point too, right? Like we're, he, he rightfully gets angry with the people, um, you know, because again, right, it's, it's reiterating their lack of faith, right? It's, it's more and more, um, right? And, and again, if you, if you think about you know, if you try to put yourself in their shoes and, and everything that they had seen to that point, right? They, they had seen all the plagues, right, in Egypt. Hard to explain, right, how all that happened, right? They, they had seen all that. Uh, they had seen the water be made drinkable, right? Throw the tree in the water, the, the water becomes drinkable. They had seen that, right? They had seen bread rain from above, right? They had seen that. They had seen the quail appear, right? And, and yet, right, they still doubted, right, they still doubted what the Lord was doing, and so with the final reading here, we're going to read uh, verses 21 through 35, and we're going to see if the Israelites can get their act together here, let's see. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of the Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning, and as Moses commanded, it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna, and it was like white, it was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come, so that they can see the bread that I have given you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, 
Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant of law and so that it might be preserved. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. And Omer is one-tenth of an epa. Just for your information. <laughs> I, I love that last verse. I'm like, do I include that last verse? Do I not? You know what? The Lord thought to put it there. I'm putting it there. That's, uh, that's a funny verse there. So, so, so yeah, so we start off verse 21, right? And it, it kind of feels like, okay, they're getting it together, right? They're going to listen. The people are going out. They're not gathering on the Sabbath, right? This is good. Okay, they're being obedient. And then we get to verse 27, right? And it's some people go out, right? And it's, you know, I think we can all relate. It's always some people, right? It's always those people. Why are they not listening? Uh, yeah, so they, they, they go out and they gather on the Sabbath, right? And again, they show the, the lack of faith and trust in the Lord and, and what he's asking them to do. And right, because again, it's not... It's not about the bread. It's not about that specific thing. It's about where their hearts are, right? What are they trusting in? Um, and so again, they, they, they go out, they gather on the Sabbath, um, of course, right? They, they carried over the food and it, right? Got maggots in it, right? They go out on the Sabbath, no food. We told you there was gonna be no food, right? They're, they're not successful. Um, and so now we see, right? Now we see the Lord asking Moses, right? How long will you refuse to keep my commandments? And, and, and that you there sounds a lot like he's talking directly to Moses, but in, in the Hebrew, that's, that's a plural form of that word. So, in, you know, in, in Texas, it might be y'all, right? How, how long are y'all going to not listen to what I'm telling you to do? Um, again, probably could have asked that question a lot sooner, right? Uh, but, but again, maybe that speaks to how patient our God is, right? I mean, when you look at how patient he had been through everything before this generation of people, right? He's been patient, right? He's been, he's been exceedingly patient. Um, and then we see in verse 29, right, the, the reiteration of the Sabbath being called out. Because again, it's another thing to think about, you know, when these Israelites are saying, hey, it would have been better to be back in Egypt. Well, there was no Sabbath back in Egypt, right? The, Pharaoh wasn't giving them a day off because they worked really hard, right? So it's these things that I think sometimes we can overlook, right? The blessings that we've been given when we encounter these difficult times, right? But just this fact that the Lord made a provision for a Sabbath for them, right? Is something that I think they're just completely overlooking, at least the ones who are, who are not obeying. Um, and so again, I, I think that's something that, that's very... Uh, important for us to, to sort of look at our own lives, right, and see what what provisions is the Lord making for us, even when things don't look like it, or even when things are, are difficult. Um, and then, you know, sort of towards the end of the of the chapter, right, we, we see the Lord saying, preserve, right, some of what I'm providing to you for your future generations, right, and again, just another great message for us, right, to preserve the things that we've seen, right, the things that we are blessed enough to read in our Bibles that have been preserved for us, uh, for our future generations. Um, and so, you know, as you guys continue through the book of Exodus, right, unfortunately, you're not going to have to wait much longer, right, to see the continued disobedience, right? I mean, this is going to carry through the next few books of the Bible, and, you know, I think you could probably say to this very day, right? There's there's plenty of, of, of disobedience to go around. Um, so so I think probably where I'll leave this chapter today is, um, again, kind of what I started with, right? I think it's easy for us to look at these Israelites and say, yeah, bad, right? Obviously that was bad what they were doing, right? But I think if we put ourselves in their shoes, I think we would struggle. Right? We would struggle with a lot of the same things that they struggled with at the time. And I think even to this day, you know, again, like I mentioned, we have the Bible, we have the word of God, what he's telling us to do. And yet it's not easy. Right? It's not easy to be obedient to his commands. And so um, I think probably the, the, the two main things I would leave you with is, is one, 
start by looking up, right? Like I know in my own life, that's where I need to start is looking up first, right? And putting my eyes on him to see who he is and what he's done to provide for us, uh, how faithful he has been through all of history, right? We see all of his faithfulness uh, and, and, then, and then look inwardly, right? Again, I think it's easy for us to point fingers at others who are being disobedient, uh, but I would say after you look up to God, look, look inwardly to yourself, right? And, and, and I think the more we do that, I think the more we'll have a, a, an obedience to the Lord, we'll have a heart for the Lord. Um, I know our marriages will be stronger, right? I know our relationships will be stronger. Uh, and I know the things that we share with our children and with our grandchildren will definitely be more in line with what the Lord is asking from us and, and, and from our obedience. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, maybe a little shorter than maybe you guys are used to, but um, I, I think that would be my prayer for, for us today is just that we would be that kind of people um, who would have that heart for the Lord and to realize that we are God's chosen people. We are his chosen people, and, and you really see that here in the book of Exodus, that as God's chosen people, he is trying to separate them. He is trying to create them a different identity than all the other people groups that are around them. And so that's really my prayer for us today as we have gone through Exodus 16, is that we would see those things in our Lord and that we would be those kind of obedient people that would have a heart to, not perfectly, right? We're never going to do it perfectly, but that we would have a heart to be obedient to him. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why I'm standing here in front of you today. That's a little nerve-wracking. But uh, So thank you for your time, and that's what I have for today. Do we, what's the protocol? Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can relate to your, uh, your, your message here, uh, you know, with over 100 team members at the store, many of those, probably 70% of them are, are youth and millennials. And I was thinking, trying to kind of apply and think through uh, them, thinking, man, that's kind of controlling. You know, you just give us one kind of manna. Right? There's, it only tastes like honey. Where's chocolate, man? Right? And uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with today. We try to uh, provide leadership and, and, and care, and it comes across controlling or uh, not very sensitive to the needs that are around us. Uh, and let's let, uh, hopefully, hopefully someone was praying for Moses during this, this poor guy, right? It doesn't get any better. No, unfortunately, unfortunately not. Um, but what I like about, I mean, I mean, we've just been hitting, I mean, we're only in the 16 chapters right now of Exodus, and everything is repeated again and again and again as we went through the plagues, and now we're going through, you know, manna. And in fact, how many years did they eat this? 40. 40 years, guys? I mean, that shows me that they're as thick-headed back then as we are today, right? And God continued to provide, and so is he continuing to provide for us? Today, it may look a little different, right? It's still manna, and it's got different flavors to it, different textures. Uh, sometimes it's green, which is great. Sometimes it's it's a, it's a relationship, right? Sometimes that's all we need to get us through the day. Amen. I mean, just somebody that maybe we can help is a lot better uh, than than sometimes them granting us, you know, finances or something. We need we need to minister to others. And he puts people in our paths mm -hmm. and he provides for us. And that's what gets us through the day, you know. So, absolutely. all right. So I know uh, the people that are going to go work the Taste of Cottonwood. I haven't, you know, I've made it through the whole day. I haven't said Taste of McKinney. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you need to leave and go go do that, thank you for that. Yeah. Mary. All right. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. All right. Dearly Father, we... Uh, we do thank you for uh, just the constant provisions that you give us. Thank you for uh, just your love for us and that you will, you've shown us again today that you will, you'll always prepare the way. You'll always provide for us what our needs are. Sometimes uh, the needs are great. Sometimes the, the needs are, are very small and there are others around us that will pitch in and help us. So there's just so much that we've been able to learn through today's lesson. Thank you, Joe, for, for sharing that with us. And uh, Lord, we just pray that we will we will constantly, hopefully continually, uh, uh, look up and, and search your face and 
constantly see areas in our lives that, that you are providing, you are taking care of us, and uh, hope that we never take that for granted, but we will, we will do so with patience, and uh, thank you for the guidance that you give us each and every day. So in Christ's name I pray, amen. amen.